Next, I'm going to wrap up the late complications of pregnancy by talking about diabetes. We're going to start with a case. We have a woman who's 27 weeks pregnant and presents for routine prenatal care and is given her one hour glucose challenge test with a result of 145. We're asked what the next best step would be. And we're given the options as to whether to treat or to perform some subsequent tests. The answer in this case is to perform an oral glucose tolerance test. Treating with insulin or sulfonylurea at this point is premature as the one-hour glucose tolerance test is simply a screening test. And the standard in pregnancy is to follow the one-hour screening test with a formal three-hour glucose tolerance load. When treating a patient with diabetes in pregnancy, it's important to know if they had pre-gestational diabetes or diabetes before pregnancy. In this case, diabetes is classified in the standard ways of type 1 and type 2. The physiologic review recall that type 1 is an immunologic destruction of the pancreatic cells which requires insulin replacement, whereas type 2 is a disease of glucose intolerance and may become worse during pregnancy. So why does diabetes in pregnancy matter? Well, these patients are four times more likely to have preeclampsia, two times more likely to have a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage, and they have increased rates of infection and increased rates of postpartum hemorrhage. In addition to the maternal complications, there are a number of fetal complications associated with gestational diabetes. Congenital anomalies are increased in these fetuses, particularly heart defects and neural tube defects. Fetal macrosomia, or fetal weight greater than 4,000 to 4,500 grams, is increased due to the increase of glucose transfer along with growth factors during diabetes. These fetuses are particularly at risk for shoulder dystocia, where the fetus's shoulder gets stuck under the pubic symphysis during delivery, and several complications can occur from this. These fetuses are also at higher risk for preterm labor. There are some differences when taking care of pregnant patients who have diabetes, and the Step 2 exam may hone in on the differences between routine prenatal care and prenatal care in women who have diabetes. There are a couple of additional prenatal tests that we would order. The first would be an electrocardiogram, as maternal heart disease is increased in women who have diabetes. We would also obtain a 24-hour urine for baseline renal function, as kidney function can decrease in women who have diabetes and may cloud the picture when you're trying to diagnose preeclampsia later in the pregnancy. We could obtain a hemoglobin A1c, which would give us an idea of how the patient's blood sugar control has been over a longer period of time. Additionally, the patient would need an ophthalmologic exam for baseline eye function and to assess the condition of the retina. Treatment of diabetes is pretty straightforward in pregnancy and is discussed here. Pregestational diabetes is broken down by type. Those who have type 1 diabetes will need a constant replacement of insulin similar to those with type 1 diabetes who are not pregnant. Their insulin pump will use long-acting insulin or they can give long-acting insulin injections. In patients who have type 2 diabetes, they're either going to need subcutaneous insulin with a combination of long and short acting, or some patients with more mild forms may do oral medications in the form of metformin or gliburide. How to approach antenatal testing in women who have pregestational diabetes varies widely among high risk obstetrical providers. The general rule is that there is more fetal testing in order to compensate for the increased rate of stillbirth in women who have diabetes. And this can be modified based upon how poorly controlled the diabetes is and whether or not they have other pre-existing conditions, such as coronary artery disease. Here, we review some of the tests that can be done and the reasons why, and some of the general timelines for their ordering. At about 32 to 36 weeks, we'd begin non-stress tests on a weekly basis and obtain an ultrasound. The non-stress tests assesses for fetal well-being, where the ultrasound can assess for fetal size and rule out macrosomia. At greater than 36 weeks, we begin more rigorous testing, with twice-weekly testing using NSTs and biophysical profiles. The NSTs, again, are for fetal well-being, and the biophysical profile also looks at fetal well-being but can assess the amniotic fluid, which can be abnormal in women who have diabetes. At 37 weeks, if the patient is very poorly controlled or there are other conditions, we can consider ordering a less than to sphingomyelin ratio or one of the other 
tests for fetal lung maturity, which can be used to determine if an induction of labor could be safely achieved without placing the infant at risk for respiratory distress syndrome. At 38 to 39 weeks, we would continue the testing that we had been doing prior and consider an induction of labor at 39 weeks. I'm going to turn now to gestational diabetes, which is glucose intolerance identified during pregnancy. There's a physiologic connection here. There are several pregnancy-associated hormones which affect glucose metabolism. Most notably is human placental lactogen, which is produced by the placenta. It promotes lipolysis and decreased glucose uptake, predisposing these women to diabetes. There's a number of complications, which are similar to those that we saw with pregestational diabetes, in that preterm birth is increased, fetal macrosomia, as well as birth injuries due to fetal macrosomia are increased, neonatal hypoglycemia. Now remember, there's an increase in fetal insulin, secondary to the living in a hyperglycemic environment in the womb. When the fetus is delivered, the excess insulin can cause the neonate to become hypoglycemic. Finally, development of overt type 2 diabetes in the postpartum state is significantly increased, being four to times more likely than women who don't have gestational diabetes. I'm going to talk briefly about shoulder dystocia. It's an important step two topic because the bad outcomes are so easily testable. Some of the complications in terms of maternal bad outcomes involve increased rates of postpartum hemorrhage and fourth degree lacerations. The commonly tested fetal outcomes are increased risk of a fractured humerus or clavicle, asphyxia or cord compression, or different types of brachial plexus injuries. We'll review a few of these here. If you have injury at the C5 to C6, you end up with Herb's palsy and see a weakness which involves the deltoid and infraspinatus muscles as well as the biceps. As a result, the upper arm is adducted and internally rotated and the forearm is extended, while the hand and wrist movement are preserved. If Herb's palsy inv involves C5 through C7, you end up with extension and pronation of the forearm and flexion of the wrist and fingers, commonly referred to as waiter's tip posture. If the injury occurs at C8 through T1, we have Klumpke's palsy, which is the most infrequent pattern. It manifests as an isolated hand paralysis and Horner's syndrome. I've alluded to the diagnosis of gestational diabetes in previous sections, and we'll discuss it in full here. It's obtained as routine screening between 24 and 28 weeks gestation. A one-hour glucose challenge test involves ingestion of 50 grams of glucose with a measurement of a serum glucose one hour later. It's considered positive if greater than 140 milligrams per deciliter. If positive, a three-hour glucose tolerance test is obtained, which involves ingestion of 100 milligrams of glucose after obtaining a fasting glucose. Subsequently, three measurements of serum glucose at one, two, and three hours are obtained. This flow sheet summarizes the last slide. The glucose load test of 50 grams is given and one hour later, a serum test is measured. If less than 140, the patient does not have gestational diabetes and can undergo routine prenatal care. If greater than 140, the three hour glucose tolerance test is obtained. If all of them are normal, the patient does not have diabetes and doesn't need any further testing. If they have elevations of two of those four values, we consider them to have gestational diabetes, and the patient warrants further screening and testing. Now, the Step 2 exam may ask you about treatment of gestational diabetes. If you have just diagnosed somebody with gestational diabetes on the Step 2 exam, the next best step in management is a diabetic diet and exercising. You'll also have the patient check their blood sugars at home. They'll be checking both fasting and postprandials, and if those are poorly controlled, typically defined as a fasting greater than 90 to 95 milligrams per deciliter, or a one or two hour postprandial greater than 140 milligrams per deciliter or 130 milligrams per deciliter respectively, medications may be indicated. Medical management is obtained by adding insulin or an oral hypoglycemic. A few tips when answering questions on the Step 2 exam about treatment. Do not tell patients to lose weight. This is the most common wrong answer on the Step 2 exam. Additionally, if you pa place a patient on medical management, we need to put them on the field testing schedule. We use the need for these medical management as a proxy of 
severity of disease, and thus increased risk of stillbirth. Another common question that can come up is what to do with diabetes after pregnancy. The answer is always going to be a two-hour formal glucose tolerance test postpartum in order to screen for diabetes. Recall that these patients are as much as four times as likely to develop overt type 2 diabetes.